Well, two weeks ago, we talked about finding our focus. Somebody say focus. And we, talk, we were talking about finding our focus. We, we were talking about finding our focus in four areas and how we talk and then in our time and our talent and our treasure. So in every one of those areas, we need to find focus. And we, we, we began to talk about that and we looked at how we, we have to determine what we're going to give our focus and attention to and how what we focus on and what we magnify in our life gets bigger. And the enemy's always trying to distract us. Come on, are you here? He's always trying to distract you. He doesn't care if, if you have a one-time thing with God, what he wants to do is keep you distracted so that you never build on that encounter. And, and so we, we had some poster board and, and stuff up in the front, but I'm going to do it with a slide today. And we talked about how the, the world has this system that Pastor Ryan, when he came on our anniversary, he called it the mammon system, or you could even say the mammon mindset. And mammon is more than money, it's a system, it's a mindset, it's a, wor a worldly way, if you will, of thinking of things. And just like here, mammon system is screaming at you. Anybody ever experienced that? Where mammon is in your face, mammon is big, mammon is always drawing attention. And when you look there, you immediately see mammon system. But then if you look over here, there's this little thing that's kind of out of focus. And, and, and it says kingdom system. Somebody say kingdom. But this year, we're discovering that God is bigger. Come on, somebody say God is bigger. And so when you focus on on what seems to be small, Bunny C7X9. Don't focus on that. Thank you. It was great timing. You, when, when you focus on that kingdom system, all of a sudden it changes and that magnifies and the mammon system gets small and out of focus. Because what you focus on you magnify, and what you magnify, you attract. So, so when, the, but here's the deal. The enemy is a bully. So he is always trying to throw that mammon system in your face when you wake up in the morning, and the mammon system tells you that there's not enough. The mammon system says there's scarcity. The mammon system says you'll never have enough. But when you start focusing on the kingdom system, you move from scarcity to abundance, from seeing lack to living in overflow, from never enough to more than enough. And things begin to change. And here's the irony. When you focus on God's abundant supply, you steward your little into multiplying into much. Because in the kingdom, everything begins with a seed, but it doesn't stay there. In the kingdom, seeds always grow. And so what you focus on, you magnify, and what you magnify gets bigger in your life, and some things begin to change. So, so that's why Jesus said, seek first the, keep for, seek first the, seek first the, he said it all in the same context of you can't serve God and money, or God and mammon. So he said, in that same context, same chapter, he says, seek first the kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. Some folks wonder why they don't have all these things. It's because you don't have first things first. Somebody say first things. See, first things are supposed to go first. So do you understand today that you can do a first thing last and it still might be a good thing, but you don't get the same result as if you do the first thing first. See, there's a lot of things you can debate over what comes first. You, you can debate over what you're going to wash first in the shower. <laughs> Big debates over that, you know. 
If you ever saw the show Friends, they had a whole episode over it. You, you, you can debate over something, but, but God gives us some first things that aren't up for debate. And they're kingdom principles, and if you get them first, you get them right, and everything else gets added. So, so if you give God your time first, then you're amazed at how much time you have. But if you try to squeeze in God the last 10 seconds before you go to sleep, <laughs> you didn't have no time all day. That's why David said, early will I seek you. So I need to give God the beginning night. Some of you work night shift. Your first is when everybody else is last, but, it, uh, but still it's your first and vice versa. So you want to give him your first time. If you give him your talent first, how many of you know he'll multiply your talent? If you give him your treasure first, how many of you know he'll multiply your treasure? That's, why, that's called tithing. That's why we tithe. People tell me all the time, pastor, pastor. You know, I just, I can't afford a tithe, so, so you know, I, I paid all my bills, and then when I paid all my bills, I didn't have any money left over, so I didn't have enough money to tithe, so I didn't tithe. But when I have enough money left over at the end of the month, see, I got more month than I got money. And so, so when I have more money than I have month, instead of more month than I have money, then I'll tithe. But see, that's not first thing. That's putting first things last. But I've never, never, in 52 years of living, never met a consistent tither that put God first over a consistent period of time, stayed focused and let nothing distract them, that ever regretted it, and also that couldn't pay their bills. Why? Because you got to flip it. you got to get first things, first things, first things. Then all these things. We, 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 I, I had some stuff with the camera last time. We're going to do something a little bit different this time. Um, Jesus said, seek first, focus on, seek first, focus first on the kingdom. So it's kind of like if that cameraman focuses on me, if he does just, if he just has me, and there's not a lot else added to that shot. And, and, but why? Because he's focused right here on this little bit of me. Do you know if you focus on God first, then he expands your world so you narrow to grow. You, you narrow your focus so that you can grow and expand to all these things. So, so watch, when you focus on that, then watch what's added. Look, look at what's added. Then the, see all these things. Somebody say all these things. There's all kinds of other things up here that God added that would not be added, come on, until you focus first. But some people want all the things without giving God the first things. Are you still with me? See, some folks are one focus away from being able to operate on another level. Some folks are one focus away from being able to, to go and operate on another level. And I came with an assignment today to help somebody step up to another level. I'm going to help. So I, I don't know. Maybe it's you. Come on. Turn to your neighbor and say, maybe it's you. Turn to your other neighbor and say, maybe it's you. Turn to yourself and say, maybe it's you. I, I, but, but somebody's going to go to another level today. But, but watch this. The closer you get to your greatest season or your next level, the more focused you must become. Jesus got laser focused the closer he got to the cross. Now, when I was in, in school, getting, in graduate school, getting my master's, Dr. Bobby Clinton did over a course of several weeks some teaching that I'm going to condense into about two minutes. But, but he said that over, that our life is made of seasons, and, and what happens is throughout those seasons, we focus on the, if we focus on the right things, we move from season to season, from level to level, from glory to glory, from faith to faith. But if we don't do that, we get easily distracted, <laughs> Some people can't make it through a 30-minute sermon. And they wonder why their life is all messed up. 
And so, so, so he said, Dr. Clinton said, said, in your 20s, it's a season of discovery and competency. You're discovering who you are and what you do, and then you're getting competent in it. That's your 20s. And in your 30s, you move from discovery and competency to mastery where you start mastering your craft and honing it and getting better and better at it. Then in your 40s, he's talking about people that keep moving, keep progressing. Then in your 40s, you, you, you know who you are and you know what you do and you're pretty good at it. You've honed your craft. Now you're looking for your ultimate contribution or your major platform, the best arena to get out what's in you, out of you, and to the world. And then in your 50s is a transition time where you begin to, to stop thinking just about what you're going to accomplish and you start investing in others and you start writing those books you didn't write and doing those things that you hadn't done. Then in your 60s, 70s, 80s, as long as you live, you, you invest and you start looking at legacy, not destiny. Because at 75, how many of you know you don't have as much destiny as you have, leg as you have history? So you need to be investing in legacy. Come on. But he, but he talked about how some people get stuck. See, it's okay to not know who you are and what you're doing when you're 22. But when you're 62, you ought to have some of that figured out. And if you don't, it means somewhere along the way you lost focus or you didn't grow or maybe you were never. He's talking about somebody that's been born again their whole life. Come on. Are you here? And, and, and so, so he talked about these seasons. Now, Jesus only lived 33 years, so he didn't go through all of those seasons the same way. And he only had three and a half years of earthly ministry but in that three and a half years of earthly ministry, Jesus went through some, some phases, if you will. He went through some seasons, and there were elements that changed in different parts or different times of his, of his ministry. So two weeks ago, we were talking about finding focus. This week, we're talking about maintaining focus throughout the seasons of life. And if you'll do that, God will take you from level to level. So, so, so what are these elements that Jesus had in his ministry? I'm going to give them to you real quick. Number one, first thing is the miracles. First he had miracles. Somebody say miracles. His miracles began at Canaan. Remember, what, what was the situation, the context around Canaan? Canaan, the wine had failed. So Jesus moved into a season of miracles at the moment of humanity's failure. So the first miracle Jesus does is get you born again. He moves into your life, and he changes some things in a moment. And it's all in the context that the, the, the text says the wine had failed. That was a massive failure. Because in, in Middle Eastern culture, for the wine to fail meant the party failed. If the party failed, then the marriage could fail. If the marriage could fail, then the families are going to fail. And, and there's going to be humiliation and all kinds of terrible stuff happening. So, so Jesus, in that context, turns water into wine. And they said the, of the miracle that this is impossible. You save the best for last. So he switches the order of some things. I believe that God wants to come into our life and make some things that should have come at the end. You say, why, does the, why did they save the, why, why should they not save the best wine for last? Why did the best wine go first? The best wine went first because you still had taste buds. They had a three-day wedding. Come on, you drink for three days, you, you don't care what it tastes like at the end. And so they're saying, listen, nobody does this. You give a little bit of the good stuff, then you slip in the <laughs> cheap stuff. But you put the expensive here. Do you know that Jesus does the same thing in your life? You have no money, but then all of a sudden he does a miracle. And whatever you lost in all those first years, God gives you back in those later years. Maybe you had no, a terrible marriage for 20 years. And suddenly the thing that, that, that hadn't been, all of a sudden last things become first. And first things become last. And he switches that order around. Why? Because he wants to come into your life and do a miracle. And then from that miracle, he does all these other miracles. Blind eyes open and deaf ears hear and miracles happen everywhere. He did lots of miracles. Somebody say miracles. 
People love the miracle phase. They, they love when you're in your miracle phase, when you can do the stuff and you got the magic. You got the Midas touch. Everything you touch turns to gold. You make toast and pictures of Jesus appear on it. Everything is wonderful. And, you're, you know, it's the heyday of your life. It's when you're the most successful. So when you're an entrepreneur, people love it when you're making millions. If you're the stud on the football field, everybody loves you. But, but, but you don't always stay. In miracle phase, in miracle phase, everybody flocks to you. The crowds gather. The miracles are happening. And when the miracles happen, they come. Miracles are great, but watch this. Jesus never focused on the miracles because to Jesus, the miracles were a phase, not a focus. They were just a means to an end. It wasn't his primary focus. See, after the miracles, then comes the message. He moved from feeding the 5,000, that was a miracle, to then preaching to them on the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who. (laughs) How many of you like that message? Blessed are those who. We love that. Blessed are those who. Blessed are those who. So everybody's wanting to know their best life now. Everybody wants to know how to live the blessed life. And so we love that. But then he said, uh, but you can't serve me unless you're willing to drink my, my blood and eat my flesh. And everybody said, I don't like this message. Deuces, Jesus, I'm out of here. And he said, you love me when I fed the 5,000 and did the miracles. And you love me at the beginning of the message when I was telling you all the stuff you like. But will you still love me when I say things that are hard for you to hear? When I correct you, will you still love me? In the miracle phase, everything works. But in the message phase, we're learning to follow more than a miracle. See, if you focus on the miracles, you'll always have to have another miracle for God to move in your life or to think he's moving in your life. You know, when you get saved and everything's working, you're in that miracle phase, you pray for auntie and she gets healed. Or if you're from the country, aunt. I don't know why we say A-U-N-T, aunt, in the country, but that's how we said it. And so you're, you're, you, you pray for her, and she gets healed. But then, 10 years later, you know, she was already 72 when you prayed for her the first time. But you get this miracle, y'all, oh, Jesus did it. I say, I told Jesus, you just heal Auntie. I'll serve you all the days of my life. I'll never turn my back on you. I'll stay focused. I'll tithe. I'll give. I'll go to church. I'll do everything. Oh, Jesus, just don't let Auntie die. And then Auntie lives another 10 years, and she dies. Next time, you say, God, I prayed. I told you I've been, I, I came to church at least seven times the last 10 years. Why, why didn't you heal Auntie? Do you know everybody that Jesus healed ultimately died? Is that a revelation to you? I mean, they're not still here. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he died again. And everybody probably wept the second time like they did the first time. And they probably wonder, why didn't Jesus show up the second time? We were upset he didn't show up in time the first time. But then now he never showed up and we buried him. He dead. His bones are rotted. He dead. He gone. D-E-A-double-D dead. And we wonder, sometimes we think, Because we don't get a miracle every time, then we live in this immaturity. And and if we live and stay in miracle phase, then we always have to have a miracle to motivate us. But when you move into message phase, then you are, you are not just focused on, on a miracle, but you understand there's a message that's deeper than the miracle. And even when I don't like the message... I still stay connected. John John the Baptist wasn't liking the message he was getting. See, what are you talking about? He's about to be beheaded. And so, you know, this is Jesus' cousin. Come on, everybody say cousin. It's cousin Jesus. Cousin Jesus. He knows cousin Jesus. I mean, John, John leapt in his mama's womb when Mary just mentioned him. So, so. He, he knows about Jesus. He baptized cousin Jesus. 
He's seen him do all the stuff, but he doesn't like the message because the message is you'll figure die. And so he sends somebody. He says, go sell code in Jesus. <laughs> is he the one? Or should I look for another? Man, how many times do people get all excited? They go to church for a week or two, and then they don't get everything they want, and they say, is, are you the one or should I look for another? <laughs> you ain't doing it for me no more. <laughs> Come on, are you here? And, and, and Jesus said, watch this, watch this, watch what Jesus said. He said, Jesus said, tell John, the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the one who is not offended because of me. Watch this. He said, John, you've seen me do all the miracles, but I'm not fixing to do one for you. Blessed are you if you don't get offended by the part of the message you don't like. Now you're maturing, John. And he said, John, there's something bigger than the miracle. Listen in the message. You got to learn. We got to learn to listen to the message even when things aren't working out the way we want. We get attracted to a leader or a ministry or a church because of the miracle. We get attracted because of maybe even parts of the message we like. But when the message shifts into a phase that maybe doesn't tickle my ears or make me feel good, am I still connected to the message? Somebody say message. Jesus had an incredible message. He had great miracles. Miracles are great. He had a message that was great. Jesus really didn't focus on the message either because, see, for some folks for the, are there for the miracles, but they leave when they don't like the message. And some people stay for all the message, but then there's a few folks that stay around long enough. They hang around long enough to stumble into this next phase called the moments. Somebody say moments. Come on, touch your neighbor and say moments. You, you, you can get the message, you can get a, the message at church. You can get a moment at church, but not all moments happen in church. Some moments happen anywhere. Jesus comes walking on the water, and you say, no, that should have been in the miracle phase, but it wasn't doing anything for anybody, really. It was creating a moment. On the Mount of Transfiguration, they had a moment after the resurrection the phase we're living in right now because, you know, last week was Resurrection Sunday. And so these days, for 40 days, Jesus created some amazing moments. At the tomb, Mary had a moment with Jesus that forever changed her life. On the road to Emmaus, two disciples had a moment that changed their life. Thomas, who was doubting, was sitting there saying, I'm doubting, and Jesus walks through a wall. And you say, there again, that's a miracle. But again, it wasn't really doing anything, performing anything. It was just creating a moment. And he said, he said, touch my, my scars, touch my side. He said, Thomas, it's really me. What was Jesus doing? He was creating a moment. And doubting Thomas turned into faith-filled Thomas. And he died, burned at the stake in India. That moment changed his life. Peter goes back to fishing. He says, screw all this. I'm going fishing. And he gets out there and he's fishing. He's caught nothing. And Jesus shows up on the beach and creates a moment. Has anybody in here ever had a moment with God? No, no, no. I don't think you have. I said, has anybody in here ever had a moment with God? that so radically changed your life that you were never the same from that moment? See, I had a moment at 12 years old. I was sitting, my, my, my father and father were getting a divorce, and I sat with a pistol in my hand thinking if I blow my brains out, maybe I could leave a note, kill myself, and my mom and dad would get married or, or would stay married, and their marriage would get reconciled and restored, and my, my, my sister and them could live as a family, and everything would be great. How many of you know that was a lie from the pit of hell? But sitting there holding that gun, I had a moment. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, Dwayne, 
I did, Jesus didn't die so that you would have to die. He died so that you could live and you don't have to take your life so that somebody else can have life. I died so that you can have life and bring life to other people. And I had a moment with God and I put that gun down and I never, ever thought about killing myself again. Why? Because I had a moment. Somebody say moment. I, 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 at 13, I had a moment. I was, I was visiting, uh, we went to a conference, and, and a guy named Ed Dufresne, who's gone on to be with Jesus, was preaching, and he gave an altar call for people with serious anger issues. I had them. I, my, I, my anger was so bad that I would envision killing people. I, I, I would get so angry. I wanted people to die. And I walked up, and he laid his hands on me, and I hit the floor. The power of God hit me, and I laid there for what I thought was three or four, five minutes. But, but my family said I was there over an hour. And in that hour, I had a moment. And I got up from there, and I, and, and I never wanted to kill anybody ever again. And the anger that was so deep. I'm not saying I never got angry, but I never had that deep-seated anger like that because I had a moment. Somebody say moment. I, at 14, I had a moment. My mom was so depressed she couldn't get out of bed. She was starving herself. She, was, she was, couldn't get me to church, and I was determined. I wanted to meet with God, so I illegally got in my mother's truck and drove to a little charismatic church with about 40, 50, 60 people in it. And a little short, fall, fat, ball-headed preacher looked over at me. I was on the side. He was preaching this way. They had two pews over there. I snuck in late because I drove slow because I didn't want to get a ticket. <laughs> And he pointed over there and he said, he started prophesying to me. And in that moment when he prophesied, one word from God changed my life forever. And I realized my father may have left me, but my heavenly father will never leave me or forsake me. And in a moment, I knew that I was called to prophesy to nations and to go do something. Listen, has anybody ever had any moments? Then at 22, I had another moment when my pastor said, hey, have you ever Ever thought about Mary and Chris Trammell and I said no I ain't never thought about it and I got in my car and I was driving home and all of a sudden I had a moment where Jesus said you're going to marry that woman and I said hallelujah and in that moment I decided I was going to marry the best woman in the world and three children and now a grandbaby on the front row I had a moment that forever changed my life has anybody in this house ever had a moment? If you've ever had a moment with God, you ought to take about 10 seconds, stand to your feet, throw your hands in the air, and thank God for a moment. No, 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 no. Somebody, thank God you were going to hell. You were going to bust hell wide open, but you had a moment. You were depressed because you got dumped. But God, you had a moment. You were going to marry the wrong person. But you had a moment. You were broke, busted, and disgusted. But you had a moment. Somebody say moment. I, you, you sit down, I, I go all day. At 28, I, I got invited to go to a, to a revival meeting. I didn't think I had time for revival because I was revival. I was already in ministry, had two kids, three kids, I don't know. Most of them, I think, were here. They just kept coming. Chris was very fertile. She would have had 72 children if we wanted to, praise the Lord. You look at them trammel girls, they get pregnant anyway. 
somebody said, come to this revival meeting. And, and I didn't want to go, but Chris and I went on a, on a Sunday night in July. Downtown Fort Worth, a guy named Rodney Howard Brown looked at me and said, you're out there, stand up in his South African accent. I can't do that. It'd sound Australian. <laughs> and I stand up and he waves his hand and says, be filled. And I started running backwards uphill. It's a slanted building. 2,000 people in the auditorium. I hit the ground. Didn't know what happened. Came to. I thought I was awake the whole time, but in my world, I was there about a minute, minute and a half. Tried to get up, had to crawl back to my seat. They said I was there close to an hour. I had a moment, and I determined that the presence of God would always be a part of everything I did. Then, in 2000. Six, walking through Golden Triangle Mall, I had a moment. Chris and I were just walking through the mall, and there was a group of young men, and they were, you know, now everybody wears skinny jeans. Back then, they wore baggy jeans. Their jeans were back down, you know, below the, behind. And uh, they were headed somewhere. You could tell they were going nowhere. And I said, man, this city's filled with a fatherless generation. And the Holy Spirit said, will you be their father? And I had a moment. And last week, 69 people were born again, committed their life to Jesus because 13, 14 years ago, I had a moment. And you had a moment. And many of us had a moment. Somebody say moments. See, moments don't come every day. But if you walk for God, lock, walk with God for long enough, you'll have some moments. We don't remember time. So what do you mean? We don't remember years. We have birthdays. But on your birthday, you don't remember your whole life. What do you remember? Moments. Somebody say moments. You don't remember, you don't remember days or weeks or years or months, but you remember moments. When, when somebody dies, you don't remember the whole of their life. You remember moments. That's why it's important to spend moments with people you love while they're alive because one day they won't be living. And you get no more moments. My father, I, I, he's been gone for four years, and I still miss new moments. I hate that he missed the moment that my grandbaby was born. That day I wanted him there so bad, but there was no moment with him. My father-in-law passed away last year, and I was so sad because he was, he knew about baby Zion. But he missed the moment. I'm, I'm telling you, folks, sometimes we get so distracted with life that we miss the most important moments. Sometimes we're so busy on Instagram that we miss the moment. Some people in the presence of God are so busy Instagramming the moment that they miss the moment. Can we learn how to be present and just put our focus long enough to say, I'm not going to let anything distract me. I'm going to pay attention in this moment. How many times at meals have we missed moments? How many times at football games have we missed basketball games? Have we missed moments? Because listen, our children don't remember the years, but they remember the moments. This came alive to me with my 24-year-old son this week when we went to go. I said, hey, you want to go see uh, the final Avengers with me? I'm not going to give the spoiler, so don't yell at me. I'm not going to tell you that what happened was. But, but when we were going, he said, do you remember you and I went and saw the first one? I said, no, I don't remember. He said, remember, it was Hulk. Hulk was the first one. I said, oh, yeah, I remember going to see Hulk. But he said, we were living in England, remember? 
And he said, remember, he said, he said you remember Kelsey and Ashton couldn't go. That, that made it a great moment. Because Cody lived in a woman's world. And so when he had guy time, that was a big deal. And so he said, he said, I remember they couldn't go. It's just you and I. And he said, we couldn't get in the parking lot by the place where we normally could park because it was full. And we had to go to that other parking lot and go up several flights. And then remember, we walked along the river and we talked about the movie. And we went into the Odeon. And do you remember? And he knew all the detail. He was like eight. But all those years later, he's 24 now, he remembered those moments. I didn't remember it. Why? Because to me, it was just another moment. But to him, it was a moment that was forever embedded in his mind and in his heart. And I'm just taking a moment to tell somebody, don't miss the moments. You'll never get them back. Jesus had some great moments, but Jesus didn't live just for the moments. He, he had all these wonderful miracles and, and an amazing, incredible, awesome message, and, and he had these hair-raising moments, but he understood they were all a part of something bigger. You see, the thing that Jesus was always focused on, and this is what you, I want you to get, was not the miracles. Those are a phase, not a focus. Not the message, not the moments, but the mission. The mission. Somebody say, mission. He knew that all these things supported the mission. What is a mission? It's an assignment. And your divine mission is just your divine assignment. God designed us to live life on purpose, not just with purpose, but on purpose. He designed us to live life intentionally. I talk about this all the time, living intention, with intentionality. God is always intentional, and he's always going somewhere. Jesus said, come follow me, and then he didn't sit down. He said, come follow me, then he went somewhere. In Eastern world, they live life thinking circularly. In the Western world, we think linearly. We draw lines. God, draw, God uses both. You say, what do you mean? We're not Eastern only where we just go in a circle and come back as a caterpillar or, you know, a pig or a goat or a cow or whatever. You know, we're not just living life in circles on the same level. But also, we understand you rarely go from point A to point B without a detour. You're going on a journey. Somebody say journey. Psalms 84 says, blessed is a man whose heart is set or focused on the pilgrimage or the journey. See, we may be going like this, but we don't keep going around the base of the mountain. We keep going up and up and up and up. Somebody say mission. What's your assignment? What's your assignment? Most of the church world is focused on the miracles or on the message or on the moments. And they're so focused on those that they miss the mission. But I want you to get this, and I'm almost finished. Don't miss the mission. Don't miss the mission. John chapter 18, I'm going to read some scripture to make this legal. John chapter 18, verse 37, Pilate said, therefore, to him, are you a king then? Jesus said, you say rightly that I'm a king for this cause. Somebody say, this cause. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. See, Jesus wasn't focused on being a king. He was focused on his cause. Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What's that? Message. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. What's that? Moments. To proclaim liberty to the captives. What's that? Message. Recovery of sight to the blind. Miracles. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Moments. Verse 19, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Message. See, Jesus was anointed to do all those things, but that was the vision. That was the landscape. That wasn't the mission. The mission was him becoming the Messiah to sacrifice, have an assignment to sacrifice his life to save humanity. 
His mission is found in 1 John 3, 8. It says, for this purpose, somebody say this purpose. The Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus' mission was to destroy all the works of the devil in your life. Paul said, Paul standing before King Agrippa, he said, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. When you get focused on me, Paul standing in chains before the king. And he's standing before the king, he's smiling. They said, what's the matter? He said, I think I'm happy. And they said, what? He said, I think, I think, I think, I think I'm happy. They said, I think you're crazy. You're in chains and we're fixing to behead you. And he said, no, 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 I think I'm happy. And he tells them the story of how he had a moment where he was knocked off a donkey on the road to Damascus. And he said, that moment gave me a mission. And I've never been disobedient to the mission, ever. Somebody say mission. Don't miss the mission. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, don't miss the mission. If you, if you don't miss the mission, you might miss some things. You're going to miss some things like sleep. <laughs> See, there, there are people that get up early every Sunday morning to come prepare for the miracles and the message so that you can have a moment, but they don't get no sleep. I, I, so, so that I can give you a message and create a moment Last night I went to bed at about 11.30. I got up at 4.30. I get up at 4.30 and begin to pray. I've already prepared. I've already studied. I've already prayed. But I get up to get ready to prepare an atmosphere. Why? Because I'm on a mission. Come on, somebody say mission. When you're on a mission, you miss some things. Some, some people some people miss the message because they have a Mission. So what do you mean? Like the people back there in the nursery, they're not hearing the message. They're letting you hear the message because they have a mission to love your child. Come on. Sometimes you, you, you may miss a miracle. You may miss a moment. You may miss because you've understood something about the mission. See, the mission is where you begin to die to yourself. The mission is where you go to Gethsemane and ultimately to Calvary. To get the, 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 the mission is where you grow up and you mature and you go because maturity is, 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 is not an age, it's a stage. And so in the mission, you grow up and you understand the miracles were for me. The moments were for me. The message was for me. But the mission is what I give for others. Jesus stayed focused on the mission. See, the mission is what you do that's not for you. <laughs> you didn't catch that. See, the mission is what you do. It's not for you. Everything else is for you. It's what you do that's not for you. So let me ask you a question. What do you do that's not for you? What are you doing that's not just serving Yourself, Jesus, see, he, he said, guys, I'm at Gethsemane. You've been with me with the miracles and the message and all these moments. But can you follow me through to my mission? Some of you say, well, I don't know my mission. I don't know my mission. There's a lot of things that can help you. You can get a book called The Path by Lori Beth Jones. The Path. It's called The Path by Lori Beth Jones. And you go through that book and there's a workbook you can get and she helps you discover your mission. You can even write a mission statement. We help people do that. You can, you can, uh, there's lots of tools. You can think about what makes you mad, what makes you sad, what makes you glad in the world. Those things are hidden gems that can give you secrets into your mission. But if you don't know what your mission is, you know where you can start? It's called the Great Co- mission. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. Make disciples. When you get involved in
in Jesus' mission and you stay focused on that, everything changes. See, Jesus understood something. He said in, in this text that we had talked about two weeks ago where he was headed to Jerusalem, it says he set his face. Then a few verses later, if you keep reading, he says, the harvest is plenteous. It's, there's plenty of harvest, but the laborers are few. So he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send laborers. Do you know it never hit me? But watch this. Jesus never said, pray for souls. Never said, pray for the harvest. He said, pray for workers. Pray for people on a mission. Because if people will go work, if they'll stay focused on the mission, I'm the Lord of the harvest. Do you know last week, 69 people gave their heart to Jesus because a bunch of several hundred people were focused on a mission to take Jesus to them. What's your mission? Are you ready to maintain your mission throughout the seasons of life? It, it, it'll cost you some stuff. You won't be, you, you'll have to prioritize. You'll have to make some decisions. When I, I got a mission to preach and to prophesy and be a prophetic voice to nations, travel the world, I, I spent my life doing certain things so I miss some other things I miss going to I missed out on going to rave parties and stuff and getting drunk and I never did that I miss joining a frat and waking up you know not knowing where I've been for three days I, I, I miss that I missed out I missed on smoking weed and not knowing and, and getting DUIs and thrown in jail I missed all that stuff why because I had a mission I missed a lot of things. Some of them like that were bad and I'm being a little funny. But I also missed some other things. I, I missed, I didn't always get to go play sports with everybody else. I didn't always get to go have, I didn't have the college experience everybody had, good or bad. I didn't get to do certain things. But you know why? Because I had a mission. And, and, and I didn't learn how to do something. I, I cannot fix your car. If it's broke, don't ask me. I can't fix it. I can't build you a house. I can, I can barely swing a hammer and hit a nail. I don't do that. But you know what I can do? I can build the house of God. I may not be able to build a physical house, but I can build a spiritual house. I may not be able to, 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 to build, uh, I may not be able to fix your car, but I can preach a sermon that can fix your life. I may not be able to do certain things, but I can preach and I can prophesy and I can do the things God called me to do. Why? Because those other things were not my mission. And I'm on a mission today to call to arms several hundred people that'll stand to their feet and throw their hands in the air and say, I'm not going to miss my mission. I'm going to stay focused. I'm going to maintain my laser-like focus. I'm going to give my heart and my life in my soul, I'm going to surrender to the mission. And when things are bad, I'm going to say, focus on the mission. When the miracles come, I say, focus on the mi mission. When the miracles go, I say, focus on the mission. When I like the message, I say, focus on the mission. When I don't like the message, I say, focus on the mission. I'll thank God for the moments, but when I don't feel any moments, I'm going to stay focused on the mission come on is there anybody that can just say God I surrender myself to the mission my soul devotion my 